My name is Kim, and last summer, I embarked on a solo hiking trip across Sweden, a country known for its breathtaking landscapes and rich folklore. One particular legend that had always intrigued me was that of the Storskogen Shadow, a mysterious entity said to roam the vast, dense forests of central Sweden. Locals spoke of it, although not often, but when they did, they said it was this spirit that guarded the woods against intruders. I arrived in a small village on the edge of Thorskogen, the great forest, armed with nothing but my backpack and a healthy dose of skepticism. The villagers warned me against venturing too deep into the forest, but honestly, their warnings only fueled my curiosity. The first few days of my hike were uneventful, filled with the serene beauty of nature. It was on the fourth night, camped in a clearing, that things took a turn. The air grew much colder than it should have, and a thick fog enveloped my tent. I heard whispers, seemingly carried on the wind, unintelligible, but unmistakably human. Stepping outside, I saw this tall, shadowy figure standing at the edge of the clearing. It was blurry, like a wisp of smoke, but it had a presence that was undeniably solid at the same time. It stood perfectly still, but I could feel its gaze on me. My heart raced with fear and fascination. I knew this had to be the Storskogen shadow. Gathering my courage, I approached it, but with each step I took, the figure seemed to recede, always remaining just out of reach. The whispers grew louder, a chorus of voices that seemed to echo the sorrow of the forest itself. And then, without warning, the figure raised its arm and pointed toward a part of the woods I hadn't explored. The gesture was clear. It wanted me to follow. Driven by an urge I can't explain, I complied, venturing deeper into Storskogen than I had ever planned. The forest here was ancient, the trees towering and gnarled. The shadow led me to a secluded grove, where the remains of an old stone structure lay hidden beneath overgrowth. The air was heavy with the scent of moss and earth, and I felt as if I had stumbled upon a forgotten piece of history. As I explored the ruins, the shadow watched, its form becoming more defined, almost human. It was then that I understood. This was a guardian spirit, tied to the land and its history, guiding me to a place lost to time, but not to memory. I spent hours in the grove, feeling this overwhelming sense of peace. When I finally looked up, the shadow was gone, and the forest seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. I made my way back to my camp, the experience still rattling in my mind, playing like a movie. I left Storskogen the next day, carrying with me a respect for the legend that I had witnessed. The shadow was more than just a tale. It was something that wanted us to remember. Something that wanted us to respect memories long past but not forgotten. And you know what? I will. All right, buckle up for this one. It's about the weirdest thing that's happened to me in my own house. I'm not usually one to get spooked easily, but this, this was just bizarre. So I've got this spot in my living room, right in front of the old fireplace that's been sealed up for ages. Nothing strange about it until one day, out of the blue, it just gets cold. I mean, really cold, like stepping into an invisible fridge. The rest of the room would be totally normal, but this one spot was just freezing. At first, I thought there must be a draft or something, 
I checked all the windows, the doors, even got the fireplace inspected to see if there was a breeze coming through. Nothing. Everything was sealed tight, and the maintenance guys said the heating was working perfectly. But it kept happening, always in the same spot. I'd walk through the room, and as soon as I hit that spot, I'd feel this intense cold. It was so weird, and it started to really creep me out. I even did a little experiment. I placed a thermometer in that spot and watched the temperature drop whenever I approached it. We're talking a good 10 to 15 degrees colder than the rest of the room. And it wasn't a gradual change either. It was like crossing an invisible line into a cold zone. Friends who came over noticed it too. They'd walk into the cold spot and just freeze, no pun intended. What the heck is this? They'd say. Some laughed it off, but others were just as weirded out as I was. Then other strange things started happening around that spot. Like, I'd leave a cup of coffee on the table near it, and it would get cold in minutes. Or I'd find the cat, who loves warmth, deliberately avoiding that area, which was totally out of character for her. One night, things got even weirder. I was sitting on the couch, watching TV, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye, near that cold spot. It was like a faint flicker, almost like a shadow, but not quite. When I looked directly at it, there was nothing there. It happened a few more times, and each time, I saw this flicker in my peripheral vision, but nothing when I faced it head on. I started to wonder if there was something more to this cold spot than just a weird temperature anomaly. It felt almost like, like there was a presence there. I know how it sounds, but you had to feel it to believe it. Things around that cold spot in my living room started escalating. The air around it didn't just feel cold, it started to feel charged, like static electricity before a storm. And those flickers I mentioned? They became more frequent, like shadows dancing at the edge of my vision. I decided to dig a little deeper into the history of my house, particularly that old sealed up fireplace. Turns out, the house had quite a bit of history. It was one of the oldest in the neighborhood and had seen its share of owners. But here's the kicker. The fireplace was sealed up after a fire in the early 1900s. A fire that, tragically, claimed a life. The more I learned, the more things started to click into place. It felt like maybe, just maybe, the cold spot had something to do with that old incident. I'm not typically one for ghost stories, but I couldn't ignore the coincidences. I started to pay more attention to the spot, even tried talking to it. Yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. I'd ask if someone was there, if they needed help. Most times, nothing happened. But one evening, as I was about to give up, the temperature in the spot dropped drastically. I felt this intense sadness, like a wave of emotion washing over me. And for a brief moment, I thought I heard a faint whisper, but I couldn't make out any words. This whole situation was getting to me. I wasn't sleeping well, constantly thinking about that spot, the fire, the person who died. It felt like there was unfinished business, like something was lingering. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I contacted a local group that dealt with paranormal stuff, not ghost hunters or anything, but more like historical researchers with an interest in paranormal phenomena. They came over, did some readings, and actually confirmed a significant temperature drop in that spot. They also felt a presence, a kind of residual energy. Their theory? It was a kind of imprint left behind, an emotional or energetic residue from the tragic event. They did some kind of clearing, a way to acknowledge and release the trapped energy. I don't know if it was psychological or if they really did something, but after that, the cold spot warmed up. The room felt lighter, and those weird flickers in my peripheral vision stopped. Since then, things have been normal. The living room feels just like any other room in the house. I still think about it sometimes, 
about who might have been there with me. Was it real? A ghost? Or just some strange environmental quirk? I guess I'll never know for sure. But one thing's certain. I have a new respect for the history of old houses and the stories they might hold. It started happening to me a few months ago. I'd put something down, like my keys or my phone, and then, poof, it'd just vanish. I'm talking about one minute it's there, and the next, it's like it never existed. At first, I figured I was just being forgetful. You know, misplacing stuff and not remembering. But then it started happening more frequently, and with things I was absolutely sure I hadn't moved. Like this one time, I placed my glasses on my nightstand before going to sleep. When I woke up, they were gone. I tore apart my room looking for them, only to find them later in the kitchen, in a drawer I hardly ever use. And I live alone, so no one else could have moved them. Or another time, I was making a sandwich. I set the knife down for a second, and when I went to grab it again, it was gone. I found it later in the living room, on a shelf. I mean, how does that even happen? It got to the point where I started questioning my own memory. Was I moving these things and just not remembering? But some of these occurrences were so bizarre, it just didn't make sense. I did some digging online and found out that this kind of thing isn't entirely unheard of. It's sometimes called the disappearing object phenomenon, and it's a real head scratcher. People all over report similar experiences, objects disappearing and reappearing in the most random of places, often with no logical explanation. Some say it's just absent-mindedness or stress, but others think it might be something more, like glitches in reality or even paranormal activity. I don't know what to believe, but it's definitely weird. These days, whenever something disappears, I just wait it out. More often than not, it shows up again in some odd place. It's become a bizarre but regular part of my life. So, if you ever find your stuff randomly vanishing, just know you're not alone. It's weird, it's frustrating, but hey, it's also kind of fascinating. I'm Jordan, and I've always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, seeking out thrill and adventure wherever I can find it. But nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered in rural Ohio. This is my experience on a desolate road in Morrow County, and it still sends shivers down my spine. It was late October, and I was driving back from a friend's house in the countryside. I've always enjoyed taking the scenic route, especially when it's fall and the leaves are that beautiful riot of colors. On a whim, I turned onto an old, barely used road that wound through dense woods. The sun was setting and the shadows grew long with every passing minute. As I drove, the road seemed to get narrower, the trees closing in around me. I hadn't seen another car for miles and my phone had lost signal. That's when my car suddenly sputtered and died, right in the middle of the road. I tried to restart it, but it was no use. It was as if the car had completely given up. Stepping out into the twilight, I felt an eerie stillness in the air. The only sounds were the rustling leaves and my own breathing. I decided to walk a bit, hoping to find a spot with phone signal or at least figure out where I was. I hadn't walked far, when I heard this soft, haunting melody, it was almost like somebody humming a tune. It seemed to come from the woods beside the road. I was curious and a little put off, but I followed the sound, venturing off the path into the trees. The melody grew clearer, a melancholic tune that seemed oddly familiar. 
and that's when I saw this woman, dressed in a white gown. It, she seemed to almost glow in the fading light. She was sitting on a fallen log, her back to me, her hair long and dark. I called out to her asking if she needed help, but she didn't respond. As I approached, she stopped humming. The silence that followed was oppressive. Then she turned to face me. Her eyes were hollow, like dark wells, and her skin was unnaturally pale. In that moment, I knew in my soul she wasn't human. I stumbled backward, my heart racing. She stood up, her movement slow and deliberate, and began to walk toward me. I turned and ran, not daring to look back. The woods seemed to close in around me, branches scratching at my face and arms as I pushed through. Finally, I got back onto the road, gasping for breath, and I didn't stop running until I got to my car. To my absolute disbelief, the moment I touched the door handle, the headlights flickered on, and the engine roared to life as if nothing had ever gone wrong. I didn't look back even as I drove away. I wanted to leave that road and whatever ghost was on it far behind. I later learned that that road was known for strange sightings and unexplained phenomena, at least locally. It was often linked to this old legend about a bride who had lost her life there decades ago. Classic story, I suppose. Every town has its jilted bride. That night in Morrow County changed me. It was a reminder that there are a lot of things in this world that defy explanation. And sometimes, maybe it's best to leave it that way. Unexplained and unrepeated. All right, so this is a bit out there, but it's totally true. I never really believed in haunted objects or anything like that. But then I got this old doll from my grandmother's attic. And let me tell you, it's freaky. So this doll, it's one of those old porcelain ones, pretty but kind of creepy with those glassy eyes. I put it on a shelf in my living room, just as a decoration. Nothing weird at first. But then, things started happening. I'd come into the room, and the doll would be in a different position than I left it. At first, I thought I was just being forgetful. Maybe I moved it and didn't remember, right? But then it kept happening, more and more. The doll's head would be turned, or its arms would be in a different position. It was subtle, but noticeable. One day, I even found it sitting on my couch. Now, I live alone, so there's no way someone else was moving it. That's when I started to get really creeped out. I mean, how does a doll just move on its own? So, I did a little experiment. I positioned the doll in a certain way and took a picture. The next day, sure enough, it had moved. And it wasn't like it fell over or anything. It was sitting up, posed differently. I showed my friends and they thought I was pranking them, but I swear, it's true. This doll was changing positions all on its own. I even tried locking it in a cabinet, and somehow, it would still end up somewhere else in the room. After a few weeks of this, I couldn't handle it anymore. It was too weird, too unsettling. So I wrapped the doll up and put it back in my grandmother's attic. Since then, nothing strange has happened but I still get chills thinking about it. I don't know if it was really haunted or what, but that doll definitely had a mind of its own. No more antique dolls for me. Thank you very much. I've stayed in many hotels during my business travels, but nothing compares to what I experienced at the Harlow Hotel, an old Victorian establishment in the heart of Maine. 
renowned for its antique charm and rumored to be haunted. The Harlow was a place I had always wanted to visit, drawn by a mix of fascination and skepticism. I checked in on a chilly October evening. The lobby was adorned with vintage furnishings and the dim light added to the hotel's mystique. The receptionist, an older gentleman with a polite smile, handed me the key to room 307, casually mentioning that it was one of the hotel's special rooms. I didn't think much of it at the time. The room was elegant, with heavy drapes and an ornate four-poster bed. There was a palpable sense of history in those walls, and I felt like I had stepped back in time. Tired from my journey, I decided to call it an early night. I must have drifted off about midnight when a sudden coldness woke me up. The room felt icy, and I could see my breath in the air. Confused, I sat up, and that's when I saw her. A woman, dressed in a flowing white gown, standing at the foot of my bed. Her hair was dark, her face pale, and her eyes, they were filled with this unspeakable sadness. I blinked, thinking that it was a trick of the light, but she was still there, looking right at me. My heart raced, and every rational explanation I tried to muster crumbled in the face of the undeniable reality before me. She was a ghost, as real as the room around me. Frozen with fear, I watched as she slowly raised her hand, pointing toward the window. Her lips moved, but no sound came out. It was as if she was trying to tell me something. The air grew colder, and the room seemed to darken. I said, what do you want? My voice was barely a whisper. She continued to point, and then, as suddenly as she had appeared, she vanished. The room returned to its normal temperature, and the oppressive feeling lifted. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. At dawn, I went down to the lobby, determined to find out more about my midnight visitor in my special room. The receptionist listened to my story with a knowing nod, and then told me the tale of Elizabeth Harlow, the original owner's daughter, who had fallen to her death from the room's window many years ago. Her spirit, he claimed, was said to roam the hotel, forever trapped in a moment of despair. I checked out of the Harlow Hotel that morning, unable to shake the image of Elizabeth's ghostly figure from my mind. I've always been a skeptic, but what I saw in room 307 was beyond rational explanation. It was an encounter that has stayed with me, and I hope I don't experience anything like that again. My name is Ethan, and I've always been fascinated by the concept of glitches in the matrix, those moments that challenge our perception of reality. But I never expected to experience such a phenomenon myself, especially not during my trip to Seoul, South Korea. It was my first visit to the vibrant city, and I was eager to explore. One afternoon, I decided to take the subway to visit the historic Jeongbokgun Palace, the Seoul subway system is known for its efficiency, so I was confident about navigating it despite the language barrier. I boarded a train at Gangnam Station, a bustling hub of activity. The carriage was crowded, and I found myself squeezed between commuters. After a few stops, the crowd thinned out, and I took a seat, watching the cityscape pass by through the window. That's when things took a surreal turn. The train pulled into a station, and the doors opened, but something was off. The platform was completely empty, not a single person in sight. This was highly unusual, given Seoul's dense population and the constant flow of people in the subway. But what really got to me was the station itself. It looked old, almost abandoned, with flickering lights and peeling paint. It didn't match the modern, well-maintained appearance of the other stations I had seen. 
The electronic sign that usually displayed the station name was blank. Confused, I looked around at the other passengers, but they seemed unfazed, buried in their phones or dozing off. I thought about asking someone, but before I could, the doors closed and the train moved on. The next station was just as I expected, lively and crowded. It was as if the eerie, empty station had been a total figment of my imagination. I got off at my intended stop, still trying to make sense of what I had seen. Throughout my stay in Seoul, I asked locals and fellow travelers about the station, but no one knew what I was talking about. I even took the same subway line multiple times, but that mysterious abandoned station never appeared again. I did a little bit of research and found that there was no record of any such station existing. It was like I had passed through a place that was momentarily caught between realities, a glitch in the word that I knew it as. To this day, I still wonder about that experience. Was it a trick of the mind, a momentary lapse in my perception? or a window into another reality. The Seoul subway anomaly remains a complete mystery to me, a personal encounter with something I'll probably never be able to explain, but it was a really cool experience either way. I've always been a bit on the fence about paranormal stuff, but what happened to me a few weeks ago has me leaning towards believing. It was late, and I was just dozing off in bed. You know, that half-asleep, half-awake state. Suddenly, I get this weird feeling like someone's watching me. I try to shrug it off as just being tired, but the feeling gets stronger. So, I open my eyes, and I see this this shadowy figure standing at the end of my bed. Now, I'm not talking about a regular shadow. This was different. It was darker than the darkness around it, if that makes any sense. And it was in the shape of a person, but all blurry around the edges. It just stood there, not moving, like it was watching me. I'm lying there, heart pounding, trying to figure out if I'm dreaming or if this is really happening. I blink a few times, hoping it'll disappear, but it's still there. I can't see any features, just this dark, human-shaped silhouette. I want to scream or run, but I'm frozen. It's like this figure has me locked in place with fear. Then, as I'm staring at it, it starts to fade, just slowly dissolves into the darkness until it's gone. The room's back to normal, but I'm wide awake now, scared out of my mind. I turn on all the lights, check every corner of my room, but there's nothing. No sign of anyone or anything that could have made that shadow. I didn't sleep much after that, kept the lights on and just waited for morning. I even started sleeping with the lights on for a few nights after that. I've tried to come up with some logical explanation. Maybe it was a trick of the light, or my mind playing tricks on me from being half asleep. But deep down, I don't know. It felt too real, too vivid. I haven't seen the shadow figure since then, but I can't shake the feeling of being watched when I'm in my room at night. It's like that one encounter has left this lingering sense of unease. Ghost, hallucination, or something else. I can't say for sure but it's definitely made me question what's really out there, in the dark, when we think we're alone. Can anyone explain this? By user Nicole Ferguson 6544 posted to r slash backwoods creepy in a comment. To provide some context, my dad owns a parcel of land in eastern Kentucky. I often hike and spend time alone in these woods. Currently, the trails are overgrown with fallen trees, 
making it impossible for us to use our ATV to ascend the mountain. Consequently, nobody else can either. Bordering our land is 4,000 acres of logging property and an old abandoned trail tunnel that few people approach. Occasionally, our neighbors traverse our trails, but they only come with their dogs or on their ATVs, usually at night for raccoon hunting. They tend to avoid our property when we're around, primarily because they're aware that we disapprove of their presence. Today, I chose to do some homework by the creek that flows through the main hollow, a routine activity for me. Feeling adventurous, I ventured deeper into the woods than usual. Familiar with the landscape, I knew of an overgrown trail about 100 feet up the mountain, nearly inaccessible on foot, without significant effort. I had been in the woods for roughly 90 minutes, and it was around 5 p.m. Given that it was summertime, the hollow was still bathed in daylight, and I felt at ease. However, the woods fell silent, and I distinctly heard a man's voice call out, Hey, reminiscent of how my dad would beckon me. I was certain it had emanated from the trail above. Oddly, there was no accompanying sounds of footsteps, snapping twigs or rustling leaves. Reacting instantly, I left my hammock, headed for my car, and drove home, not hearing any other sounds. Relaying the incident to my dad, he initially speculated that it might have been a neighbor. However, this seemed implausible. I had never met any of them, and why would they try to hail me, especially when they knew they shouldn't be on our land in the first place? My dad then confided that he had once encountered an unidentifiable noise in that same hollow. While clearing trails one morning, he heard a chilling shriek. Having grown up in these woods, he's familiar with the calls of foxes, bobcats, and other wildlife. This sound was different. Furthermore, he revealed that locals ominously referred to that hollow as the Devil's Den, though we're yet to ascertain the reason. The Echo in the Hallway by Margot P. I never really bought into ghost stories or anything supernatural. I mean, come on, it's the 21st century, right? But what happened to me last year in my own apartment, of all places, still gives me the creeps. So I was living in this older apartment complex in New Orleans, a city known for its spooky vibe. My place was decent, a bit run down, but it had character. Anyway, it was late one night, I was binge watching some show, and I heard this weird noise coming from the hallway outside my door. It sounded like somebody was dragging something heavy. At first I thought it was just my neighbor. He was known for collecting all sorts of junk. I ignored it and went back to my show. But then it happened again the next night, and the night after that. Always around 1 a.m., this dragging sound, like someone was pulling a chain across the floor. I finally got fed up and decided to check it out. I opened my door and the hallway was empty, but the sound was still there, clear as day. It was coming from the end of the hall, near the old unused elevator. I walked down the hall, a bit freaked out, and as I got closer to the elevator, the sound stopped. Just like that silence. The hallway felt super cold, and I got this weird feeling like someone was watching me. I noped out of there and I went back to my apartment, locking the door behind me. The next day, I asked the building manager about the elevator and if anyone had been using it at night. He said no, in fact, the elevator hadn't worked in years, so nobody was using it at any hour. I told him about the noises and he just shrugged said the building was old and made weird noises sometimes. But I wasn't convinced. They kept happening every night, always at the same time. It was honestly driving me nuts. I couldn't even get any sleep. I started asking around, and one of my neighbors, an older lady, told me a story about the building. 
Story goes, way back in the day, there was a really bad accident in that elevator. A maintenance worker got caught in the cables and was dragged up the shaft. He died before anybody could get to him. The story gave me chills, and suddenly those noises in the hallway took on a whole new meaning. Honestly, I couldn't handle it anymore. The noises, the cold spots, the feelings of being watched. It felt like that poor guy's ghost was still lingering in the building, reliving his last moments every night. I moved out as soon as I could, and I haven't been back since. I don't know if I believe in ghosts now, but I can't deny what I heard and felt in that hallway. It was too real, too creepy to just be some old building noises. So, yeah, that's my brush with the paranormal, right in my own apartment building. Kind of makes you wonder what other stories are hiding in the walls of old buildings, doesn't it? So, here's a spooky little tale for you. I never put much stock in ghost stories, but something happened a while back that's got me questioning everything. There's this old playground near where I live, kind of run down and not used much anymore. I often take walks at night to clear my head, and my route usually takes me past it. One night, as I'm walking by, I hear what sounds like a child's laughter coming from the playground. It was late way past the time any kid should be out, especially alone. At first, I thought maybe a neighbor's kid was playing a late night prank or something. So I go over to check because, you know, it's not safe for a kid to be out that late by themselves. But here's the thing. The playground was completely empty. No kids, no animals, nothing. Just the sound of laughter echoing through the night. It was this clear, distinct laughter, the kind you can't mistake for anything else. It sounded so joyful and carefree, which made it even more unsettling given the situation. I stood there for a minute, just listening, trying to make sense of it. But as soon as I stepped into the playground, the laughter stopped. Just like that. Silence. I looked around, thinking maybe the kid was hiding or something. I even called out, asking if anyone was there. No answer, no more laughter, just the sound of the wind. Feeling a bit freaked out, I quickly moved on, but the incident stayed with me. The next day, I asked around the neighborhood, thinking maybe someone's kid has a habit of playing in the playground at night. But everyone I talked to said the same thing. They've heard the laughter too, always at night, but never saw any kids. Some of the older residents told me the playground used to be a popular spot, always filled with the sounds of kids playing. But over the years, as the neighborhood changed and families moved out, it became deserted. Now, every time I pass that playground at night, I listen for the laughter. Sometimes I hear it, sometimes I don't. But when I do, it sends a chill down my spine. It's like the echoes of the past are still lingering there, in a place forgotten by time. A child's laughter in an empty playground. It's innocent and eerie all at once. All right. Let me tell you about something weird that's been happening in my apartment. It's one of those old buildings with a lot of character and creaky floors. But recently, it's been giving me more than just character. It started a few weeks back. I came home from work, and as soon as I walked in, I was hit with this strong smell of perfume. It was this old-fashioned floral scent, really heavy and distinct. The thing is, I don't own any perfume like that. At first, I thought maybe it was coming from a neighbor's place or something. But then it happened again and again. Always the same floral perfume, and always right when I walked into my apartment. I started checking around, thinking maybe a previous tenant left something behind, but I found nothing. And then, 
it got stranger. Along with the perfume, I started smelling tobacco. Not like fresh cigarette smoke, but that stale, lingering scent of old tobacco smoke. Again, I don't smoke, and neither do any of my neighbors as far as I know. These smells would come and go, with no apparent source. I'd smell them in different parts of the apartment, too. One moment it'd be in the living room, and the next it'd be in my bedroom. I mentioned it to my landlord, and he told me something that gave me chills. Apparently, the apartment used to be occupied by an elderly couple many years ago. The woman loved her floral perfumes, and the man was a heavy smoker. They both passed away a while back. Since then, the scents have taken on a whole new meaning. Sometimes I come home, and the perfume smell is so strong, it's like someone just walked past me. Other times, the tobacco smell lingers in the air, and I almost expect to see someone sitting in my armchair, puffing on a pipe. I don't know if it's my mind playing tricks on me, knowing the history of the place, or if it's something otherworldly. It's eerie, but in a way, it's also kind of comforting, like the couple is still here, making sure their home is looked after. So, yeah, that's my story. My apartment comes with its own set of phantom scents. It's weird and inexplicable, but it's become a part of my life now. Who knows, maybe I've got my own little ghost story in the making. I'm a strong believer in listening to my gut. I always have been and always will be, since it's gotten me out of a few situations. One was my freshman year of high school. School had ended for the day, and since I was staying at my dad's house that week, I decided I would walk home. His house wasn't that far from school. Everything was fine, until I turned down the street where there's a shortcut. It led straight into my neighborhood. As I was walking to the shortcut, a man drove by staring at me. My stomach dropped and turned. I took this as a note to walk a bit faster. By the time I got into my neighborhood, the man was circling around the cul-de-sac, waiting for me. He had a smirk slowly creeping onto his face as I walked by his car. I tried to ignore him the best I could and just kept walking. He would drive past me and yell vulgar things at me. He kept turning around and driving past me again and again. As I turned down my street, he followed closely behind. I saw him drive down my street and turn into someone's driveway to turn back around. I quickly got into my house and locked the door behind me. I then turned around to look through the peephole so I could see if he left. He didn't. The man pulled up into my driveway and got out of the car. Luckily, my neighbor, who's a family friend, was out in his garage. He came over yelling at the man and then stayed with me until my dad got home. A week later, my dad told me he saw the man parked at the end of the street, waiting for me. He went and threatened the man and we haven't seen him since, but I'm still freaked out every time I go and visit my dad. It's safe to say, I won't be walking home alone ever again. When I was around 11 years old, we lived in a log cabin in the woods of Dedham, Maine. Though there were other houses nearby, we seldom crossed paths with our neighbors. The cabin, which was approximately 250 miles from our primary residence, had been purchased recently by my father, and we had already spent a few nights there. On this occasion, we had planned to stay for an extended weekend. Given the cabin's age, my parents had decided to have some renovations done to enhance its charm. This meant that several rooms were under construction, 
leaving us with just one bedroom to accommodate all six of us. My parents, my two brothers, my sister, and me. The night had set in, and we were all tucked in the solitary bedroom. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the distinct sound of bootsteps in the living room, an old wooden door on a rickety deadbolt lock, likely to fall apart under a strong impact, were all that separated us from the living room. As I was still shaking off the sleep, I heard my sister's voice asking if anyone else could hear the sound. That's when I realized it wasn't a dream. It was all too real. I quickly sat up to find my parents and my sister staring anxiously at the door. My heart started racing, unable to make sense of what was happening. My sister's fear-filled question, are we going to die? sent a chill down my spine. The boot steps paused briefly as my other brother began to wake up, but then they resumed. There was no fading, implying the source of the sound was stationary. A sense of fear and worry pervaded the room as we tried to understand how someone could have entered our locked cabin. As my last brother woke up, the boot steps ceased altogether. In response, my father retrieved the machete he had kept under the bed, cautiously approached the door, and listened for any other sounds. Then, with one swift move, he unlocked the door, flung it open, and brandished his weapon, ready for an intruder. He checked the living room and the other rooms, only to find everything undisturbed. All the doors and windows were still locked, and nothing seemed to have been tampered with. Getting back to sleep that night was a struggle. In the morning, the memory of the previous night's events still haunted me. Those crystal clear bootsteps were real, a fact confirmed by my family, leading me to believe that we had had a paranormal encounter. Despite our attempts to explain the event rationally, we have yet to find a plausible explanation and one thing I'm sure of, those boot steps originated from inside the house. This remains one of the most frightening experiences of my life. If you have any logical explanation for this, please let us know. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city, 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female, and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient, and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up, and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. 
Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size 7 foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up, got her in the truck for transport, and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72 hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night. I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, you are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. One night, a long time ago, in the mid-80s, I was riding around my hometown at about 10 p.m. with three other friends. Berkeley County, South Carolina was really country back in the day, so driving around at night on dirt roads is one of the things kids did to have some fun. The place we were driving to was called the Gravel Hill Light. It was down a long dirt road in the middle of the Francis Marion National Forest. There were no street lights of any kind and no houses for miles. Up until that point, I had seen the light a few times and even to this day, nobody knows what it is. I know it's so bright that it's almost like a welder's torch, but about a hundred times bigger. There's no sound at all and it disappears as soon as it appears. Anyway, this night we were on our way to see the light. We would usually park our car where the dirt road divides into another road, and after 10 or 15 minutes, the light would appear. We were driving and we hadn't even made it halfway yet to the place where the road divides, when we saw in the distance a red glowing light with fog and the outline of a body standing way down in the middle of the road. We had to drive slow, like 25 miles an hour, because of all the potholes in the road. We were curious and we all said, 
what's that, at the same time. Then the glow turned off for about two seconds and came back on. This time, there were three to four figures standing in front of the red glow, and this time they seemed to be about 50 feet closer to us than before. They were in contorted positions, but not moving at all. The light went off again, and two seconds later, it came on. Again, they were much closer to us, and this time, there were about 10 figures silhouetted against this light, all standing in weird positions. I began screaming, turn the car around, now, I mean now. Everybody in the car quickly agreed to turn around and get out of there, which is exactly what we did. Back then, I always thought of the figure standing there as ghosts. But nowadays, I'm thinking more alien than ghosts. At 18 years old in the 80s, it just never occurred to me that it could have been alien. But now, it makes so much more sense. My friends and I really haven't talked about this since it happened. I'll start out by saying that I have seen my fair share of strange things in the skies, but one memory will always stand out amongst the others. I've done the math and I believe it was fall of 2005. I was in sixth grade, outside on the phone with my first boyfriend. I'd say it was between six to eight o'clock Eastern time at night. It was dark outside and only our back porch light was on. I was talking up a storm and I was watching my two dogs roam the backyard. Out of nowhere, it was like somebody turned on a blue light above us, the dogs and I. It was a bright, beautiful electric blue. I immediately looked up and saw what I can best describe as the shape of an eye, but perfectly symmetrical in the same blue color. It was lined with an almost holographic looking light a constantly changing rainbow of colors. I stared for maybe two seconds before it closed up, leaving only the colorful outline. It immediately shot to the left like a shooting star and disappeared. In shock, I told my boyfriend I would call him back and I immediately ran to my parents who were folding clothes in the bedroom. I shouted at them, I just saw aliens. They laughed at first and told me to stop joking, but my father knows my eyes. He saw my panic and quickly changed the subject. I've never forgotten this moment. I can still see it so clearly, even to this day. What did I see? Why did I see it? Can anyone help? Back when I was still going to high school, I spent the night at my best friend's place. He lived in a basement. I woke up and went to the bathroom, and as soon as I got back to the room and laid back down, I closed my eyes. Then, I felt like someone or something was staring at me. I opened my eyes and saw a pale child staring me in the face. His dark eyes felt like they were staring into my soul. I yelled out for my friend, and as soon as he came into the room, the child disappeared. I told him what happened, and of course he didn't believe me. But now he says that apparently everybody who's ever slept in that room has seen him. His girlfriend, his brothers, and me. But he has never seen the boy. To this day, I can still remember what he looks like. So I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. 
My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night, sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly, so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day and he casually says, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and I assumed that my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle and then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl, I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable, 
I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. This happened a few years ago, but my husband and I still talk about it. If he hadn't been there, I would have written it off as some kind of dream. My husband and I were walking around on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. We decide to stop for a drink at the hotel and soak in the ocean view. We walk up to the hotel and we didn't notice much until we walked inside. When we walked into the hotel, the entire hotel was empty. Nobody was there. There was nobody behind the counters, not a single soul in the lobby, just empty. But it also had this weird buzz of energy, as though people had just been there. There were papers on the counters, cups on the tables. We walked inside through the restaurant outside by the pool. No one. We walked back inside through the lobby. We probably spent about five to 10 minutes there and we never saw one person. We left because it was so creepy. Back on the street, everything was normal. People walking by, traffic, everything you would expect. I have no idea what caused no one to be there. It almost felt like the Truman Show where you go off the script and they don't have any actors ready. I would love any thoughts on what you think happened. Also, we were totally sober and we thought perhaps it could have been evacuated, but there would have been people on the streets. I mean, it's a hotel. We asked around later and nobody knew anything about anything that had happened that would warrant a hotel. So to this day, we still don't know what happened. When I was in Northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious. It just felt bad. Like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. In the early 90s, my parents sent me to a YMCA summer camp in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It was called something like Matalonike, and it was located on the shores of a series of man-made lakes in Medford Lakes, so not exactly backwoods. We all knew the stories of the Jersey Devil, but the camp had a few of its own ghost stories. The White Lady, said to have jumped off a bridge on her wedding day, and Hatchet Harry, an axe-wielding maniac who got kids that wandered into the woods. I assumed both of these stories were developed to keep kids from wandering off. What I encountered was neither of those. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bunk, hearing some rustling in the bushes. The cabins were basically a half wall with screened windows all around, save for the back wall, with eight bunk beds, four on each side. You could lay in your bunk and look right out the windows. It really sucked though when it rained because there were no shutters to close. I had heard this rustling, so I grabbed my flashlight and I shined it into the bushes from across the front of the cabin, sweeping from bottom to top. 
There was nothing else in that direction, save for woods, as our cabin group was right on the edge of the camp. I didn't see anything out there, so I put my flashlight back, but kept it next to me and got ready to settle back in. But then this light reappeared. It was this bluish white light and flickered slightly, kind of like a firefly. The light slowly followed the same path that my flashlight had traced, from bottom to top, and then it disappeared. It scared the hell out of me, but I didn't bother to wake my grouchy counselor. She wouldn't have believed me anyway, since she already thought that I was just a troublemaker. So I just smushed down into my sleeping bag and tried to get back to sleep. I never saw it again after that point. My best guess is some sort of firefly that thought my flashlight was a prospective mate, although the fireflies in that area usually had a greenish hue. I've shared this story before, but I've never really gotten a satisfactory response. Maybe I'll never know what that was, and maybe it was something totally natural, but I still thought it was really freaky. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god awful, low guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. In the summer of 2019, I became fixated on this ruined castle hidden deep within the woodlands, a day's cycle from where I lived. It is by no means easy to access. We often rode our bikes there, and there was a lot of lugging them through the mud, up hills, and down hills that were too narrow for a bike. Every week in June, my buddy and I would ride out to this castle pack lunch, and make a day out of it. I still have fond memories of those cycles. The castle itself harbored an underground chamber that could be accessed by a small tunnel, leading you into this subterranean room that was strewn with rock and plastered with graffiti. I haven't been to the castle in a while now, but if I remember correctly, some of the graffiti read things like no one leaves and Satan is good. Now is probably a good time to mention that the castle has a long past with rituals and so-called devil worshiping. I've had three peculiar happenings at the castle and I suppose I'll tell them from least likely to be paranormal to most likely. It was by no means a summer day. The sun made the occasional appearance 
but mostly remained hidden by clouds. To me, it seems like the way to get to the castle is always guarded by an unholy amount of mud, even if it hadn't rained for days. So our bikes would always be splattered by the time we got home. Once under the shaded canopy of the trees and with the mud far behind us, we approached the ruins with the same amount of giddiness we always did. Our giddiness was shattered though, when we heard the sounds of children floating down from the ruins. We liked having the castle to ourselves, which in hindsight is pretty selfish. But upon arrival, we found that no children, no families, nobody at all was present. This struck us as odd, seeing as the castle sits on a hill. We ruled out that any family would dare venture down the steep slopes, especially if they had children and we never heard any children's voices again. The second incident was when I was waiting outside the entrance of the tunnel, about to duck down and head inside, when I heard a sharp whistle right beside my ear. It was as if somebody had placed their mouth mere centimeters from my ear and whistled. The third and final incident was when we brought candles to the castle to take some nice photos of the illuminated chamber. The chamber itself is littered with dried leaves, and being paranoid that a rogue spark from the match could potentially cause a fire, we lit them outside and carried them in. On the fourth or fifth candle, while I was lighting a match, there was a thunderous hiss from inside, so loud that I often tell people it was as if a giant snake was in there. Fearing that something had caught fire, I rushed in to find everything the way it was. No fire with the candles flickering silently. Those are the three occurrences that I've had a hard time explaining. I've been to the castle since, but nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm sure I'll be returning to the castle soon now that summer has once again rolled around. So, who knows? Maybe I'll have more stories then. At the time this happened, I had recently discovered I was pregnant, and the stress was mounting. The pregnancy was unexpected, and I was apprehensive about breaking the news to the father, who happened to be my best friend's brother. One day, as I sat with my best friend in her room, her three-year-old daughter wandered in. I held back from discussing my situation in the child's presence, fearing she might inadvertently relay the news to her uncle. Opting for silence, I lay down on the bed. The little girl approached and gently placed her hand on my belly. She offered a reassuring smile and said, everything is going to be okay, before softly rubbing my abdomen. My friend and I exchanged bewildered glances. We were certain that the child had not overheard our conversation. Her room is upstairs and she always needed supervision while climbing the steps signaling her approach. To this day, I don't know if it was a weird coincidence or if that little girl knew something. In 2013, following my amicable divorce from my wife, we both relocated to separate residences. We've remained good friends, largely due to our shared parenthood of our daughter. To ensure fair custody, I rented an appealing house located in the city's historic district. Constructed in 1935, it was well-preserved and offered a perfect home for our three-year-old daughter during her fortnightly stays with me. It was during these visits that I began to notice my daughter conversing with an unseen friend. On one occasion, I discovered her in a tiny closet, deep in conversation with a little girl that she referred to as Betty. Considering her age, I assumed this was a product of her vibrant imagination, particularly as I had no idea where she had heard the name Betty. As a single dad to a little girl, I struggled with some aspects of parenting, particularly tasks like hairstyling. 
While her mother had a knack for it, I was left floundering. One evening, I put her to bed following a bath and remember giving her a quick hairbrush, but that was the extent of my hairstyling capabilities. The following morning, when my daughter was just rising, her mom came to pick her up. She discovered our daughter's hair had been transformed into flawless fringe braids. Initially, she praised me for managing such an intricate hairstyle, but I assured her that I had not, and could not, have done it. When we quizzed our daughter about her braids, she said, Betty did them during the night. Aren't they pretty? This incident prompted me to break my lease, and we moved out within the next month. Betty did not come with us. My family has been staying in Cripple Creek, Colorado on vacation. Prior to coming here, we had no idea that there was supposedly paranormal activity. So today my fiance and I decided to take a stroll through town, taking photos and whatnot. We heard this weird static noise that almost sounded like it was coming from a loud radio pretty far away. It would come almost in waves where you would hear it for a couple of seconds and then it would just stop. This continued until we reached the casinos. Fast forward to tonight, we're laying in bed listening to a video. And I hear what sounds like a scratching noise on the window for the second night in a row. I paused the video and listened for a few minutes. After not hearing anything, I continued the video. About an hour and a half later, I was almost between a sleep and awake state, but I couldn't really fall asleep for whatever reason. Then, all of a sudden, I hear a scratch again that instantly woke me up. I sat there and listened. I heard it again. I yelled, Hey! loudly, and I ran outside with a flashlight, but I didn't see anything. No person, no signs of somebody trying to get through the screen. Nothing. After this happened, I was pretty startled and I am by no means one that believes in the paranormal. But kind of jokingly, I said, what if it was a skinwalker? But later this led me to do some research on the town and apparently it is filled with all things paranormal. I've seen several things about the casinos, the jail, but has anyone else experienced anything at one of the homes here? I'm really curious. I work as a park warden in the Canadian wilderness, typically spending my shifts in solitude from 5.30 at night to 2.30 in the morning. My jurisdiction covers around 300 campsites, several beaches, and the corresponding amenities, such as shower facilities. My park closes for the harsh Canadian winter, typically from mid-October to early April, during which feet of snow accumulate and the cold is unforgiving. Several years ago, a tragic incident occurred. A man chose to take his own life with a sawed-off shotgun by the river on one of the more secluded beaches. His body wasn't discovered until the spring thaw. This particular beach, situated at the northernmost part of the park, requires a patrol at least once an evening. One overcast day, around 7 p.m., I was at the shower facilities near this beach ensuring the first aid kits were stocked and checking the fire extinguishers. The dreary weather had deterred any visitors, leaving the beach and parking lot deserted, except for my patrol vehicle. Suddenly, I was overcome by a sense of dread. I ran to my vehicle, slamming the door shut and taking a few calming breaths to shake off the panic. Feeling somewhat better, if not confused, I stayed in the safety of my locked vehicle 
completing paperwork and logs. Given my job, not a lot scares me, so I was more shaken by the fact that I responded that way, still not knowing what caused it. Out of nowhere, a large dark figure moved swiftly past my driver's side window. Startled, I let out a scream, instinctively recoiling as I thought somebody was attempting to break the glass or open the door. However, when I checked, there was no one around. Needless to say, I delegated all future maintenance tasks in that area to the day shift and hurried out of there. It might not be the scariest story ever told, but it deeply unsettled me. Even after three years, I steadfastly refused to conduct foot patrols in that area after sundown. I once booked an Airbnb cabin nestled in the mountains of the Gold Coast with a group of friends. This cabin, with a history stretching back 100 to 200 years, was the backdrop for a series of eerie, inexplicable incidents that happened over our weekend stay. From the moment we set foot inside, an uncomfortable vibe permeated the air. The ambience seemed to tinge our moods leaving us feeling unusually drained and edgy. The house was peppered with odd objects that only amplified the unsettling feel. Scissors pinned to walls, antiquated nails and farming tools repurposed as decor, unnerving masks, a heart pierced with nails mounted on the wall, rosary beads and more. The odd occurrences commenced on our first night as two of us lay downstairs, sleep eluding us due to an intense feeling of being watched, we were startled by a resounding crash. The door leading to a small foyer, which in turn led to the living area and rest of the house, had been hit with such a force that it trembled on its hinges. On the following night, as we relaxed on the deck overlooking the forest, we tried to mimic the loud bang to our friends who had slept through the incident. After we had thumped the wall three times in demonstration, we heard three heavy thuds echoing from the balcony's corner, followed by the eerie sound of a spare chair being dragged. Feeling increasingly unsafe, we opted to consolidate our sleeping arrangements, moving a mattress into a single room so we could stick together. When three of us were in the room, a window slammed shut with a loud bang. In the early hours of the night, as everyone slept soundly, I found myself awake at 3 a.m. I noticed a shadow moving across the same window that had earlier shut so abruptly, and I started recording it. In the video, a white figure entered and exited the frame, which I didn't notice until the next day. It was a clearly visible face. The final and most terrifying event happened just as dawn broke. I woke up to find a man standing at the foot of the bed. He was adorned in traditional indigenous attire, wearing a skirt and sash in red, black, and white, and brandishing a spear. His face was drawn into a severe scowl. In my initial panic, I assumed it was one of the Airbnb owners, and I shook my friend awake. She saw no one, and when I turned to look again, the figure had vanished. Overwhelmed, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I asked my friend to leave the place early with me. Strangely, as soon as we were about a kilometer away from the cabin, I felt my normal self again. After the death of their grandfather, Redditor Omastorm had an encounter that startled and comforted them. This is the story. A few years ago, my grandpa had passed away. He wasn't a very big believer in ghosts or anything regarding the paranormal, 
until he was in his older years. Well, I ended up inheriting his 86 T-Bird. Lots of history with that car between myself and my grandpa. Anyway, a few months after he passed away, I'm driving the car to work, listening to music, and just processing the fact that he was truly gone. The car is all I have left, or so I thought. I drive toward one of my work sites and out of nowhere, I get a blast of the cologne he always wore. It was his favorite cologne to use whenever he was going out anywhere. I pull up to my work site and park the car. I can smell the cologne so strongly in the passenger seat and I'm just staring at it like, there's no cologne in here, but why does it smell like grandpa's? It took me a solid two minutes to figure out that his spirit was in the car with me. His spirit had taken a ride with me to work that day. The cologne scent didn't dissipate one bit. It was honestly reassuring to me that he was still there in a way. So yeah, interesting and odd encounter for me because of the fact that when he was alive, he wasn't really a strong believer in the afterlife. Well, I guess he proved himself wrong because he still hangs around me whenever something's wrong. Redditor Rez on the Radio tells a story about waking up to an alarming situation. Here's the story. So, I have a simple story for you. I always go to sleep with my bedroom door unlocked and the key for the door to one side on a shelf. Every time I've ever fallen asleep around people, they've said that I'm most quiet, that I'm almost a dead-looking sleeper because I move so little. To my knowledge, I have never sleepwalked. One day, I remember going to sleep as usual, door unlocked, key on the shelf. I woke up to my mom banging on my bedroom door, confused as to why it was locked. I found the key on the shelf and unlocked the door. I tried to explain that I hadn't locked it and I was just as confused as she was. It was very disorienting and I think I probably looked like I was going crazy. It's something that I've wondered about a lot in my life. I don't think I'll ever get an answer as to how I woke up with my door locked from the inside when I was the only one in there. It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact. The most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother. One bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street 
that was fairly busy all day, a stoplight only a block away from us, a very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it, that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere, but that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery, complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job, and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music, and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal, and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom, and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, clearly not hearing the screaming, and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, But... And she said quietly, There's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman. Nothing. It happened so fast. I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just... stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom, and she said under her breath, I told you not to look, and gave me this look that said, don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. When I was 8 to 10 years old, in the mid-1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples, and in the back there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there, so you could see the backs of a few houses a bit of ways through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. 
One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better. And I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were. On the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it and especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by, and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg. So I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details, but I remember all these years later and I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. This is a pretty tame story compared to some other things I've heard but I think about these experiences all the time, so I thought I'd share them. My husband and I own our home. It's fairly new, built in 2006, and only one couple has lived in it before us. As far as I know, nothing bad has ever happened here. The first experience was when I was home alone with my children. My youngest was asleep, and my oldest was coloring at the table in the kitchen. It was the middle of the day, so the windows are open and no lights are turned on. I'm in the kitchen putting away dishes, crouched down to put a pot under the bottom cabinet, when I hear the click of the light switch and the kitchen lights turn on. I turn around fully expecting my husband to be home. He isn't. Creepy, but no big deal. Months later, both of my kids are in the nursery while I'm taking laundry out of the dryer. Even though I can see into the nursery, I can't see my kids because they're playing near the bed, which is against the wall. I hear my son jumping on the bed and I keep telling him, don't jump on the bed, be careful of your sister. 
I do this a few times until I get a little frustrated and I say, don't jump in the classic parent tone. Directly in my ear, I hear a man's voice in a loud whisper say, don't jump. I immediately dropped the clothes and ran into the room. But of course, no one was there except my kids. A week after that, I walk next to our closet to see all of my husband's hangers swaying back and forth. I never feel threatened or nervous in my home, except for when these instances happen. I tell my husband about them and he says he sees weird things all the time, but never tells me because he doesn't want to upset me. So yeah, I kind of hate it. My boyfriend passed at the end of March, and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant, and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet, because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts in the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. 